Hi, my name is Alexander. I'm CTO at Streaming Fast, and uh, I'm also a pianist, a data scientist, whatever that means. I'm a father of eight beautiful children, two of whom uh, are there. I love designing and crafting software, which I've done since I was 12. And I'm here today because one day in 2013, I read the Bitcoin white paper, and that changed the trajectory of my life. And fast forward to today, Streaming Fast, a company based in Montreal, Canada, is now one of the core developers of the graph. And we joined the graph a bit more than a year ago in a kind of bizarre M&A 2.0 fashion. Our lawyers still don't understand what happened. But anyway, we said thanks and goodbye to our VCs and shifted our focus to make the graph the greatest data platform on earth. So today I'm here to introduce Substreams, which is a powerful new parallelized engine to process blockchain data. And before I can do that, I just want to set a bit of context. Perhaps you can raise your hand if you know what subgraphs are. Raise your hand if you know. Oh, wow, you're good. Okay, so subgraphs can be thought of an ETL process, right? So extract, transform, and load. And subgraphs add that little Q there, the GraphQL layer to it. And subgraphs today provide that sort of simple, approachable, end-to-end -end solution to blockchain indexing. And the graph node is responsible for all of these components, right? The extraction is done through hitting JSON RPC nodes, and then transformation, you provide some assembly script, you guys know that, compile to WASM, running in a distributed environment, and then you have the load aspect, which the graph node does, puts that into Postgres and offers you a rich, you know, and beautiful GraphQL interface on top. And one of the, reason, one of the reasons we were brought in was that we, so we could push the graph to new height in terms of performances. So to do that, we brought, first thing, the fire hose, something at the extraction layer. Our take to boosting performance by one, two, three orders of magnitude, the first layer extraction. It's a method of extracting data from blockchain nodes. Imagine prying an egg open where the data is exfiltrated as fast as possible and all the juicy data gets then thrown in a, G a gRPC stream as well as into flat files. And you can think of that as sort of a, the bin log replication stream for blockchains where you'd find in a master-slave replication engine like in databases. So we'll get back to Firehose in a minute. Then Substreams is sort of, rethink of this, rethinking of the second box, the transformation layer. Here, we, instead of the traditional subgraph handlers and assembly script, you will write Substreams modules in Rust, and those can be executed in real time as well as in parallel with unprecedented performance. So let me give you first a primer on Firehose because there's a lot of benefits of substreams that come directly from the Firehose. So, a streaming fast for many years, we've been thinking hard about all these indexing problems from first principles. And we needed at first a robust extraction layer. We wanted something that, extremely, that was extremely low latency, something that would push data out the moment the transaction was executed within a block, within an, a blockchain node. JSON RPC was not going to cut it. And we didn't want to have to deal with those large, bulky nodes, right, hanging on a thread, occupied to, to, with uh, managing high write throughput. We well, kept everything in a key value store behind a, re, you know, a JSON RPC request, uh, and it was really heavy in RAM and CPU, and you needed super optimized SSDs. It's really annoying, and all these things are much costlier than what needed when our goal was to get to the data inside. So we also wanted proper decoupling between the processes producing the data, so the blockchain nodes and its intricacies and its, its request response model, and they're all different, and the data itself. We wanted the data to be the interface. And we wanted something also extremely reliable in the sense that we could avoid hitting load balanced nodes that had all sorts of different views of the world and that we need to have like client code to like lat latency inducing code to, to resolve what's happening there. If there's you know, on a fork, you need to query nodes again. And, and you know, for reorganization heuristics, for example. But also, you know, we wanted something better than even the WebSocket streams that pretend to be sort of, you know, linear uh, that the nodes have implemented because when they would send you a signal that, like, let's say, you, this block was removed, it could leave you hanging. If, if you were happened to be disconnected for just half a second, you'd reconnect, 
you'd miss the signal. So the reliability was not built in. So we wanted something to address that. And above all, we wanted something that is able to process networks in 20 minutes. Well, okay, an hour or two, but you know, never three weeks or things where we're waiting linearly. And that's still our goal today. And when we say network history, I mean executing GEF and extracting data executed into flat files. That's the extraction layer. But also, any sort of indexing after the fact, we wanted to be able to have massive parallelization. Like, there was no other way to have reliable and durable in performance without parallelization. So our solution was the firehose. And the firehose solved all of these issues in a radical way. We took a radical approach because we wanted to solve those problems definitively. Like, meaning that there would be no further optimization possible except attempting to bend sort of space-time continuum itself, right? So with streaming, we, with even multiple nodes pushing out data, multiple nodes are actually racing to push the data. The first sort of consuming process gets the first to get out. Like, you can't really add, uh, remove more latency there. And um, there can be nothing more faster than immediately. <laughs> Uh, when the transaction has just executed from your node. And then, like, regarding uh, the stateful processes and costs, flat files, flat files for the win. We have a hashtag for that, right? Flat files are the cheapest, much cheaper than processes. They're easier to work with. You could, there's nothing simpler nor cheaper in terms of computing resources. These storage facilities have been optimized like crazy. And it's also where data science is headed these days. And there's one common thing to every blockchain protocol in that it processes data. Data is also the right abstraction for this technology, not an API that's common to all chain. Data. So Firehose clearly delineates responsibilities. And, and the contract between the extraction and transformation layers is, again, the data model. Firehose creates, and, and for every chain, you can imagine the best data model, the most complete. And that's what we've done for, Fireho uh, for, for Ethereum, for example. The, the, the data model for Ethereum within Firehose is the richest there is. Like you have in there the full call tree, internal transactions. You have the inputs and outputs as raw bytes. You have the logs, obviously. You have the state changes, like you see on Etherscan, down to the uh, um, internal transaction level. You have balance changes the same way with the prior value and the next value. So when you're doing like navigation backwards or forward, you get, you have the data you need. You have also gas costs at different places. And there's that important notion of total ordering between things happening within the logs, state changes and calls, all of these things happening during execution are totally ordered. So you get in there, everything parity traces would give you and more, and everything you would need to rebuild a full archive node from flat files. And everything there is scoped to the transaction level, not rounded at the block level, which is crucial if you want to index with precision, right? It doesn't, rounding of blockchain information at the block level is sort of a, was meant for helping in consensus, right? But it doesn't mean that what happens mid-block is of less value than what happens at the boundaries. So, okay, so that's very interesting. And now regarding reliability, whoops, no, not so fast. Regarding reliability, the Firehose gRPC stream provides reorg messages like new block or undo this block or this block is now final accompanied by a precious cursor. I think that's really key here with each message. So if you get disconnected and upon reconnection, you give back that cursor, you'll continue exactly where you left off and potentially receiving that undo signal that you would not have seen where you disconnected, right? So you will get it. So with the guarantees or linearity of the stream. So no WebSocket implementation would do that because it doesn't make sense for a single node to track all the forks possible even two days after the fact. And undo messages come with full payloads. So you get all the delta. So you can just turn around to your database and apply the reverse or, you know, pluck again in the, the, the full payload of what happened in the block and decide what to do. It's, it's so it doesn't pose on the reader to store what happened like at that previous block if the signal was just remove block 7,000, right? Okay, and when you commit that cursor to your transfer database, well, you get through that, you know, finally some consistency guarantees within your, you know, your, uh, your backend. So some of our users told us they could cut 90%, 9-0 of their code reading the chain because they were relying on some, th that reliable stream. And okay, and it also lays, lays down the foundation for massively parallelized operation files plus a stream 
And so this is the future of the graph's unbeatable performance. And it's core to our multi-chain strategy because, you know, any blockchain can have that data model. Uh, now let's dig into substreams. Substreams is a powerful clustered engine to process blockchain data. It's a streaming first engine and it's powered by the fire hose underneath and its data models of the chain. So let's dig in. Here are a few quick facts. It's invoked as a single gRPC call and within the request we provide all the transformation code like you'll have in there, oh, it's too low, huh? You'll have in there the code, some, some WASM modules, relationships between the modules and uh, you know, all the, transaction, the transformations within the request. It's not a long running process except if you run it for long, it's not a, a service you, you spin up, right? And the backing nodes are stateless which provide nice scalability properties. Modules for transformations are written in Rust, they compile to WASM and they run in a secure sandbox on, on the infrastructure there, similar to the subgraphs. And the ultimate data source being the blockchain data, being deterministic, all the transformation outputs are also deterministic. And the request, if the request you send involves process prior history, even if it's 15 million blocks, well, the substream's runtime will then turn around and orchestrate the execution of a multitude of smaller jobs in parallel, fuse the results on the fly for you, and aggregate the results to simulate a linear execution. So you would see a dime in the difference. And all the results are streamed back to you as fast as possible with the same guarantees provided by the fire hose with a block per block cursor and a transparent handoff from batch and, and historical processing to the real time low latency rewards aware stream of the head of the chain. So let me show you if you're interested how we create one of these things. Raise your hand if you're curious. Okay, you're good. Okay, so let's start. We start with a manifest like that. Do you see that down here? Can move the podium? I can't. So there's package information, you know, some metadata there. You have pointers to the protobuf that you'll use. Again, contracts between modules are about data. So there are protobuf models similar to the protobuf models of the root chain, of the chains, the layer ones. And you have pointers to the binary that you're working on your drive and all that. And you have imports. And imports are actually very interesting because you can import third-party substreams packages. And these YAML can be packaged. And so you can import from someone else's package, you can write your own or combine both. That means substreams enables com composition at transformation time, which I think is pretty unique and a pretty game changer. And then follow up, and there you have the module sections, which defines the relation between the different modules. And you see it defines sort of a directed acyclic graph. You have um, modules that slowly refine the data. And so there's two types of modules. One, the mapper, the first up there, map pools. And this one takes inputs, does transformation, and outputs. It's parallelizable down to its core blockwise, so massively parallelizable. And then there's the store input. I think it's awesome. This one takes any inputs and outputs a key value store that are sort of an accumulated in a stateful way. And stores can then be queried by downstream modules. And, um, okay, so we'll see a bit more after. The, the name corresponds to the function in the WASM code, and the inputs can be of a few things, either the raw fire hose feed, so for example, the source here, that means the block with all transactions, you know, for, for that particular block, and it can be the output of another module, like you see down here, the input of map map pools, so you'll get the data as bytes. And it can also be, see, be a store, which would be a reference, we'll see in the next slide there. And on the store pools here, you see there's an update policy, which sets constraints on what you can do with the store, and it defines a merge strategy for when you're running paralyzed operation. Okay, I'll get to that also a little later. And the value type field, well, helps anyone decoding understand what bytes there is in that store. So you know, UI, you can JSONify them, and your code consuming can automatically you know, decode them with protobuf, all languages supported. Otherwise, the key value is just keys, uh, strings, bytes, values, very simple. And one thing to note here is that because it has deterministic inputs, it's possible to hash a module, like the kind and all of its inputs and the pointers to its parent and including the initial block. So you have a fully determined and hashable, let's say, cache location for all of the history, similar to Git, right? All of the history of data produced by, by, by and you'd hash also the WASM code, right? So it makes it for an extremely cacheable system, 
and highly shareable and cross-verifiable output of modules, which opens really interesting possibilities you know, for uh, collaboration within the graph ecosystem. And imagine that one has large disk and one has large CPUs or you know, sleeping CPUs. They could pull resources together to build something bigger than themselves. Okay, and you see the relation there? So this gets piped to that. And if we add another module here, you see how the graph comes together. This one c computes the price. This is Uniswap v3 thing. Uh, it computes the price, but it, you want to get them for certain pools because maybe you want to use the decimal placements in the pool. We'll see a little bit more there. And when you're running, let's say you're running that at block 15 million. Well, you're guaranteed, the runtime guarantees that the store you'll have to execute code at block 50 million will have been synced linearly or in parallel, but you wouldn't know. But it'll give you a full in-memory store, eventually backed by some disk, but whatever. And you can query the key value store at each block. It's guaranteed to be synced for you. That's exciting. No? OK. Uh, so you see the DAG slowly being built, huh? Right? Uh, the dependency. So now let's, 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 this leads us to composability. See, each color here means a different author. And modules written by different people, ideally the most competent for each, right, like we would hope, uh, they would crop, you know, analyze what's on chain and refine the data and abstract it to new heights. And the contract between the handoffs is always data. It's a model of data. So you take a module, it's bytes in, bytes out. And so you see here, we can get the prices from Uniswap v2 and prices for Uniswap v3 and Sushi and Chainlink and whatever, and have someone write a module that takes these input at transformation time and then averages them out and whatnot, right? And then that you'd have that sort of one beautiful universal price module that you can then hook on top and, and, and feed to some, who knows, maybe someone feeds that back onto the chain for some reason. And then soon enough, you know, whoosh, all of that, well, someone wants to build on top of it. Yeah, something like that. If like someone wants to compute, you know, the USD denominated volumes aggregation of NFT sales on OpenSea, you know, you'll take some sales, you'll merge it with the price, and we see here that little trader ink. Like he seems he, maybe he wants to, to feed that into his trading bot because this is a streaming engine. We're not storing that in the database yet, right? But this begs the question: Where does that, all that beautiful data land? Where does it get piped? That's where syncs head up, like. Substreams being limited to the transformation stage of the ETL analogy, remember? It doesn't really care where you load it, and that could be anywhere. These are just a few examples. You can load that in databases. We already have a sync for Postgres and Mongo. You hook to substreams, and it just loads it into Postgres with a data model that we've agreed upon, right? If you write it in a certain way, it just syncs over there. And, or message queues or whatever, you know, data lakes or some bots or some trading algorithm, you know, some, I don't know, some whale detector you want to hook directly on the stream. Or also something, I think, big for doing some ad hoc data science. Because now you have a really fast engine, allows you to process the whole history in, like, it can take a few minutes process the whole of the theorem to go and pluck some new insight. So you can write your code, send it to the network, and then, you know, stream out the results. Similar to, for those who know BigQuery, you know the cluster, the, the, the big cluster the service by Google, that's what they do. Send the request, it just shot at everything, they send you back the request. Well, all of a sudden, Substreams Engine can allow you to do some things like that ad hoc. And it, you can write any program uh, that, that supports gRPC and protobuf, which are many. And the last one here, not the least, subgraphs through graph node. Well, so we're working to make substreams feed directly into, su into graph node to then provide the same loading experience and then querying experience that you've come to know and love. And you'll be able to deploy a subgraph, this time not containing assembly script, but a substreams package with an entry point and would process the history in parallel and load that in your database in crazy speeds. So stay tuned for that. That's not out yet, but you know, soon. Okay, and so this is a simple example in Python. It's not really longer than that. You have two, one or two dependencies like gRPC, so that you can use a query, so we're leveraging a lot there. And you can, uh, you know, see that SPKG there? We can use that to code gen Python classes and helpers and all of that, because it, it turns out that the manifest, sort of the SPKG there, is, for those who know protobuf, is a file descriptor set. It contains all of the things, all the protobuf definitions. So the SPKG also contains all the WASM code, the module graph information, you know, the dependencies, the inputs, and all that, and even some documentation. Everything is needed is in there, so you can pass it down to the, you know, modules. You take it from, from the disk and 
boom, you send the request to the server and it's running. So you can deploy packages also very easily and consume them very simply this way. There's a few imports we've omitted there, but it's simple, it's just a show. Okay, and let's look at the simplified data model for Uniswap v3. And I'll show some code making use of it, okay? So this here, the pool is a list of pool. This is actually what gets handed off from, you know, our mapper, which finds the pool that were created down to the store pool, which we're gonna look also. And so it has a list of pools, and the pools you can imagine, an address and the two tokens that are concerned here. And we have a reference to the token also, which is gonna be very useful to enrich the data downstream. We'll have the decimals right at hand. Like, we won't need to do much loading. It's gonna be very, very close, so we can enrich all these U ints to 50, 79,000, and, and you know, put the, the comma where it belongs. Um, so let's see what happens in the mapper. So this is a sample Rust code. Raise your hand if you love Rust. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Raise your hand if you know Rust. Okay, it's very simple here. I'm gonna go through. You have the map pools function corresponding to the manifest there. It has one input, the block. This is the fire hose block with all transactions, all logs, all state chains. You can craft your own triggers in there as you wish, but we have a, a simple version. See that, that line there, blocks, events. You have a thing that goes through transactions and it's going to trigger on pool created. And that pool created object in Rust was actually code genned from the JSON ABI. So you can just give the instruction and we're gonna filter it for only the V3 swap factory. And then that beautiful filter map will give us the log. Okay? And then we'll, we'll output, we're gonna collect some of these things into one list of pools and it's assigned to the pools object there. And, and notice that little thing here, G, uh, this is the RPC create Uniswap token thing. This actually hits you know, an ETH call on a node behind, similar to what we have in subgraphs. And that's actually very important. It means that once we've processed this layer once, and we've done it for the history, it can be cached very efficiently. So anyone relying on that thing will never need to reprocess it again. You can give the, the package to someone and they can access the stores been, that's been cached by other people immediately. So you could go to block 15 million and you'll have the list of all pool created that you can query super fast. You can depend on it also. So I think that's pretty cool. Uh, and here that's the store modules. The store module is pretty simple. Here it receives, see, the pools from the output of the prior module. And it does, it loops through the little pools there and calls output set. And see the key there is pool colon da la la, the address. It's going to store the proto buff encoded stuff of the pool with the token decimal for both, right? Did I say that to be constrained? So the store here is constrained in two ways. In order to preserve parallelizability, the stores are write only. You cannot read your writes, otherwise, that would make them potentially cyclic. And they expose only the function defined by the update policy. In this case, it's set. So let's see what happens if we run things in parallel. So here we have two jobs covering two segments of the chain, you know, one million block each. And you see those ugly arrows there? They correspond to a pool created event. And so in our code, you've seen we would write a key for each of them. And uh, so in the first partial run, we'd have a, what we call a partial store with four keys. And the next one, we have two keys. And so when we'd run the merge operation, we would apply the set merge policy, which says basically take one store, take the other store, cycle through keys and the last key wins. If you do that, you can parallelize endlessly. So we'd have here a complete store with six keys. And now at that place, we have a snapshot. We can have periodic snapshots. And so if you want to go and explore the chain at any point in time, you have a snapshot plus a little partial. You can have the state synced at any block height. So, so this one, uh, you know, has the last key win policy, but you have a few others like min, max, add, and another one like first key wins. So if you merge them, you would have set if not exists, and then that, that allows us to build different aggregations, right? You'd like to see that running live? I have a few minutes. Now I need to bring that other window up. So do you see that? Okay, that's good enough, huh? Okay, so let's imagine we want to see that pool, pools created thing. Okay, do you see that? I want to see the output. I'm gonna run that. I hope everything is good. You know, the demo guys are connecting. Okay, okay, whoa, not too fast. So this uh, is going through, uh, starting at the beginning, and we have there a pool created event. And see that? 
We have everything decoded because it's the protobuf thing. We have the thing to decode it. We could feed that. It arrives on the wire as bytes, and you know, properly serialized bytes. And then we see that the token address is, is there. We have the decimal. We have the address. And so what that means is pretty crazy already. Oh, do I see that? OK, what that means is that you can inspect the chain with your code at any place in time. For a mapper especially, you can go there. And I could run it again here and say, and say I want to run the mapper. Let's say a block. I don't know. Uh, Something more recent. Give me a recent block. What's the block yesterday? 15, 7 million, I don't know, something like that, okay? And see, is there anything recent? So there's some stuff, right? Some things are recent. Can I see that? Someone still created a new pool, and I can inspect my code to make sure it works. Where is that? Come on. Right? This one was wrapped ether in infinity. They were just created that address as a new pool. So you can go and test your code everywhere. And once that's done, well, you're set, right? You can go then to the next data dependency. So this really changes the dynamics for debugging. And this can also work for stores, because you can ask for a store, and it's going to process it in parallel, and then you can inspect all the keys that exist there or see the deltas coming through. OK, and let me show you something running in parallel. Uh-huh, graph out. Now, this is very interesting because, oh, no, let's start it at 15 million. Let's say I want graph out at 15 million. I didn't run it again before, and I want, so let's run it. So this starts a whole bunch of parallel processes. And you see up there the number of blocks per second. Yesterday, I had that 8,000. On Solana blocks, I had 16,000. It depends on the power you put behind there. But this all, like you said, the pool count is a dependency on the pools. The pools is further down, so we're able to schedule things. And all that just massively parallel. And once that's ready, let's say everything was done, I would start streaming and get all the content. And so let me show you the graph out. It's very interesting because, because graph, out, graph out has refined the data up to entities. Now we're talking about database tables and fields, and you get, and you get out of that, do you not see it? Okay, that. Wait a second here. So let's imagine, see, we have token and an update, and you have the field derived ETH, and you have the old value and the new value. I don't know if you've seen this thing in the data science world. This looks very much like change, change data capture CDCs that can power a lot of large scale systems. And, uh, and you have the prior and after, so you can feed that to your, let's say, Postgres, apply the changes, and when you have an undo signal, it gives you back that payload. You then just flip everything, and you have guaranteed linearity, so your store with a cursor, and it's flawless. It's just extremely simple to keep your things in sync. You also want to have a Slack bot. You can have an undo message, remove the message if you have a thing coming through, right? So I think that's pretty cool. What do you think? No, wait, 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 okay, okay, okay. <clears throat> okay, that's cool. Now, can I shut that down here? Do I have another window? Uh, I'm close to done. Prepare your question. Please ask, ask them succinctly. We have a half a minute. I just wanted to have a final, final note there. So as a final note, I want to share with you a little bit of my vision for the graph. Okay? I don't know where the window is. So whatever, it just says fine. Uh, I'm, I'm imagining the graph becoming that sort of huge worldwide cluster of processing and storage capabilities and something like Google's BigQuery, but where people join because it's better together, right? Instead of running it alone, we need to have all the resources alone. And I see also a new era of composability, which means more collaboration and in a tighter community working together with more intimately in those, in those, uh, you know, with those data contracts. And I see also a new mix of collaboration between indexers like exchanging data or sharing resources in terms of compute and storage and whatnot, therefore introducing new value flows. And also I'm seeing new products, new services being offered directly on the network you know, to satisfy some needs that perhaps uh, couldn't be addressed before. And I mean, there's a place for you in there as a developer, as an indexer, as someone who realizes the radical benefits of such a platform and who, who builds on it and, and promotes it. But my ask to you is, you go to go try substreams, Put pressure on your favorite layer one so that they do integrate the Firehose natively. That's Pristine's Aptos has done that recently. Some other Starkware, I think. So that makes it everything we've seen today becomes immediately available to them. Sell them on the goodies. So also join our Discord. I'd love follow-up follow -up questions. And come see me afterward. I, I love feedbacks on these sort of things. 
all of this is open source, so let's dig uh, and, and build something of the, like together the biggest blockchain platform on earth. And thanks you for your time today. Do we have time for two, three questions? We're the last one, so if you have a question. Hey, uh, so one question. Uh, modularity and composability of these substreams is super, super powerful. But still, if I look at this compared to SQL and like DBT models, right, it's a lot more complex. So how can we enable people to really kind of learn this and like build these kind of hypermodular data streams? So because it's a good question, but the transformation layer is not the SQL layer. Like this is powering going through history. It's an ad hoc transform with stateful storage, but you would pipe dive into SQL store to do other things. Right? You have refinement, you have knowledge from the community as to how to analyze this and that protocol, ever, ever you know, increasing refinements. But then you might store that in your store with off-chain data. And maybe that's best fit for you. Maybe you feed it into a subgraph, that's what you need. You have a total decentralized solution and you don't need to host anything. So this is an enabler at a lower level. It's not a, it doesn't seek to replace SQL, but it puts itself at a place where we can feed all the systems on Earth with enriched data, which you would need to do in SQL, and it, it's, it's really not fun. So you leave okay. that to the community, right? Gotcha, thank you. Uh, we have an old subgraph, which is pretty slow, and we would like to transform it uh, to the new type of subgraph. Yes. Should I, should I only read some code on uh, Rust and that's it, or something else? So it is not the same paradigm. To enable parallelization, you need to distinguish the data dependencies, and that infers the number of stages of parallelization that is needed. It's not easy at all, actually. It's, it's pretty crazy to try to parallelize the subgraphs. We try that. That's what yield us to design substreams by cutting, you know, Uniswap stuff. So you will want to go and write in Rust modules, and it's a different paradigm. So it's not just an easy switch, I admit, but it brings us to the next stage in evolution, you know, of blockchain indexing. Yeah, I see. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Alexandre. My pleasure.